Chapter 4, Marx. Can you sleep on your stomach with such big buttons on your pajamas? Uh, no, no, not that, Marx. This Marx. This fucking guy. Honest to goodness, if I could go back in time and murder just one person in all of history, it wouldn't be Judas Iscariot. It wouldn't even be Bruce Springsteen. No, no, it'd be Karl Marx. This one goddamn egghead is responsible for more human suffering than all the most terrible conquerors put together. And though the Romans, Mongols, Assyrians, Aztecs, and Zulus all rapaciously conquered their neighbors, none of them dared to rewire humanity at the point of a gun. The thought had never crossed anyone's mind until this bearded prick came along. And just what are you hiding behind that beard anyway? Why don't you be a man and show your chin? Oh God, what have I done? Marx racked up a pretty impressive death toll for a man who sat at a desk and wrote treatises all day long. I mean, I sit at a desk and write treatises all day long, but you don't see anyone lined up in front of a brick wall on my account. Let's do a quick comparison, shall we? Vietnam. A civil war ensues between two nationalist factions who should have been united but weren't because half of them were communists because Karl Marx wrote his stupid communist manifesto. Total deaths, one to three million. China. A civil war ensues between two nationalist factions who should have been united but weren't because half of them were communists because Karl Marx wrote his stupid communist manifesto. Total deaths, 20 to 40 million. Nazi Germany. A vile madman rises to power in Germany in response to the communist menace after the First World War and all because Karl Marx wrote his stupid communist manifesto. Total deaths, 40 to 60 million. Now who have I ever killed? Why no one, uh, well, there was that one neighbor boy, always whizzing by on his blasted skateboard and look, my eyes just aren't what they used to be. I mean, I'm pretty sure I missed him. Definitely sure I did. Probably just a pothole anyway. Uh, total deaths, zero, I, I think. But all that's besides the point. You see, while Russia was fitfully modernizing and industrializing, way over on the other side of the continent, a very hairy man was putting the finishing touches on his epic monument to human imbecility. He called it Das Kapital, which of course is German for the Kapital. And it was his best attempt to explain how modern capitalist economies function. If you really want to know, and I don't know why anyone ever would, you would be much better off reading the works of the great Adam Smith, David Ricardo, or Alfred Marshall. Karl Marx himself was not an economist, but rather something of a brilliant and eccentric essayist. One with a decidedly progressive worldview, a spiteful personality, and a tendency to get kicked out of any country he lived in for more than a few years. German by birth, Marx began his career as a promising student at the University of Berlin where he fell into an esoteric social circle known as the Young Hegelians, a gaggle of brainy little creeps who worshipped at the foot of the philosopher Georg Hegel. Now, Hegel was perhaps the most German and most metaphysical of all the late great German metaphysicians. His most notable contribution to human thought was his description of the dialectic, which goes something like this. Knowledge is produced when a thesis collides with its antithesis and thereby produces a synthesis. Clear as mud, right? Why, a four-year-old child could understand it. Dialectic. Run out and find me a four-year-old child. I can't make head or tail out of it. How about an example? Plato proposes the earth is flat like a pancake. Aristotle proposes the earth is round like a bowl. From the dialectic between this thesis and antithesis, we arrive at a synthesis and end up with a world that looks something like this. Any of that makes sense to you? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I thought it was kind of bullshit. Smells like balderdash to me. But believe whatever you like. Anyway, the young Marx toys with this concept while working as a journalist and pamphleteer for various left-wing publications. First in Germany, until he was expelled, then France, until he was expelled, 
then Belgium until he was expelled, then Germany again until he was expelled again, and finally in England where he produced his most famous work and resided until his death in 1883. I've always found it amusing, but also revealing, that the originator of communism did so while living in the most capitalist city of the most capitalist country in the world at the time. The opposite scenario is all but unthinkable. Say what you will about Marx, he really believed in this stuff, scribbling away penniless for most of his life until he was brought into contact with Frederick Engels, another German expatriate living in London who was rolling in dough from his father's highly profitable and extremely capitalist textile business. All the jokes can't be good. You've got to expect that once in a while. Engels' financial assistance enabled Marx to expand upon his theories ad nauseum. But it must be pointed out that neither Marx nor Engels, taken together the fathers of communism, ever did an honest day's work in the entirety of their historically regrettable lives. Contrary to popular belief, Marx and Engels did not invent socialism. What they did was concoct a framework for interpreting history. Marx adapted Hegel's concept of the dialectic into something he called historical materialism, which claimed socialism would naturally emerge as the next phase of civilizational advancement, only to be replaced in turn by its successor, communism. But before we jump too far down into the rabbit hole of Marxism, it might be helpful to first examine plain old socialism, boogie, boogie, boogie. which has been around in some form since at least the days of ancient Greece. A version of socialism was famously put into practice by various sects during the Protestant Reformation, most notably the Anabaptists until they were massacred, and our own beloved pilgrims until they very nearly starved to death. But what precisely is socialism? Follow me, man. Never mind the men, just the women. Chapter 4, Interlude 1. Socialism. I have been reading lately that the number of millennials and Zoomers identifying as socialists has skyrocketed in recent years. But what exactly do you mean by that? If you mean you're in favor of free health care, free housing, free education, and so on... This may be wise or foolish policy, but it is not, strictly speaking, socialism. It's not free either, but since when have you little retards cared how much things cost? What most of you really mean by socialism is merely an expansion of the welfare state or some reparation scheme rooted in grievance politics. But this would hardly please your genuine socialist who, strangely enough, are becoming harder and harder to find. You used to run into these people every so often, say at parties or at work functions. There you are, just minding your own business, when who should creep up behind you but the insufferable office know-it-all, blathering on, as usual, about the labor theory of value, the deficiencies of the free market, the efficacy of central planning, and so forth, like some goddamn wind-up toy from the seventh circle of hell. Do you kids know anything at all about those things I just mentioned? No? Then shut your fucking mouths. You're not socialists. You're just confused. Not that I blame you, really. These are confusing times. Frankly, it's almost sad, almost, to observe just how low socialism has sunk in the last few years. Critical gender theory, critical race theory, radical feminism, intersectionality. It's fair to think of these things as watered-down, bargain-bin Marxist ideologies. They have none of the intellectual pedigree of their forebearers. They make no claims of predictive power. They indicate no solutions to the problems they supposedly identify. They are, at best, obscure and mischievous academic exercises the intellectual equivalent of scrawling mustaches onto great works of art, the products of decidedly lesser minds. But hey, they buy one, get one half off, so get in while the getting's good, I guess. Uh, quick point of privilege. Quick point um, of personal privilege. Yes. Privilege. Point of personal privilege. 
Very brief point of information. Point of clarification in that uh, we are going point, to... Point of information. Point, point of privilege. There was a previous point of privilege about waving around signs. Point of privilege once again. Please do not use gendered language. Everyone who is not a counter, take a seat. Take a seat. Take a seat so that we can count. Vote after vote after vote and voting on whether we're going to vote on voting. It is ridiculous. Uh, could someone please run a mic to the comrade in the jean jacket? It wasn't always thus. There was once a time when pure, unalloyed socialism seemed to millions of people as the wave of the future, the inevitable terminus of man's long ascent out of darkness and ignorance. Your generic run-of-the-mill socialist argument runs like so. Given that human beings are communal creatures who must closely cooperate to survive and flourish, all economic activity, therefore, ought to be directed by some enlightened authority for the good of the whole. While details vary, these are the two key features of any socialist scheme. The common ownership of all or most property, and the deference to a central plan for how that property should be deployed or consumed. These features also constitute the twin rationales for socialism. On the one hand, the achievement of perfect equality and material well-being, and on the other hand, the formation of a more rationally ordered society. Ergo, you tend to notice two distinct kinds of socialists, those motivated by feelings of envy or resentment, and those motivated by a desire for greater systemization, often conjoined with a general antipathy towards freedom and a pronounced contempt for the common man. You know, those smug, aloof types who like to drone on about high-speed rail or whatever. Unfortunately, political parties across the West have been steadily incorporating socialist ideas into their governing philosophies for over a century. This has resulted in many people who would not ordinarily regard themselves as socialists regurgitating socialist rhetoric almost by reflex. For example, have you ever heard someone proclaim universal health care to be a right? Universal health care may be a good use of government, or it may be a poor use of government, or it may be a mixed bag. But to call it a right is fundamentally illiberal. And yet, people do it all the time. And when you point out its socialist origins, those same people may grow angry with you, say you don't know what you're talking about, and kick you out of the little wine club. Not that I even wanted to be a part of it anyway. That was Gladys's idea. She's always coming up with these harebrained schemes to get me out of the house for God knows what reason. The worst by far was when she cajoled me into taking up jogulating. What a stupid fucking hobby. I don't understand. You just run in circles and then talk about running in circles with other people who run in circles. Some people even hook themselves up to these futuristic torture contraptions and jogulate that way. It's ridiculous. For Christ's sake, my ancestors didn't scrimp and save and sacrifice all their lives just so that I would expend needless amounts of energy every other weekend. It's tantamount to pissing on their graves. Jogulating. What a goddamn disgrace. Anyway, the main impediment to socialist reasoning is the stubborn notion of private property. Get off my lawn. It turns out that most people are rather attached to their property and would not like to see it taken away from them. Socialists respond by claiming the very concept of property is itself illusory and should be abandoned. Take land ownership. Where does that come from? Well, it's not exactly clear. If you walk to an uninhabited place, put a fence around it and call it yours, is that all it requires for you to own the land? What if, before you got there, someone else had been there but then left? Which claim should be honored? Does the land in some sense belong to everybody? And if it does, how do we decide who can benefit from it and to what degree? And if it's true that everybody owns everything, how can anybody really own anything? Wait a minute, I'm getting confused. Let's back up a bit. Even if someone can own land, how much of the land can you own? Can you own everything buried beneath it? And how far down exactly? All the way to the center of the earth? Do I own this? Is this mine? Or how about we go in the other direction? How much of the sky above you do you own? 
All of it? None of it? Surely some of it. Surely you could tell your goddamn neighbor to stop flying his aggravating gizmo over your house. But can you demand the airlines not fly over it? Can you demand no satellites pass overhead? These entirely valid questions about property have led some to conclude that the concept itself is fictitious. In my view, these sorts of people have done a good amount of pondering on a difficult question, and then either given up or, as is more likely, arrived at an answer that satisfied their personal dispositions. Property is not illusory. It is observable even in the animal kingdom. No person or animal can claim to own the twigs that fall from the trees, yet the mother robin, when she collects the twigs and weaves them into a cozy nest for her little hatchlings, will defend that nest from all encroachment. It's almost as if one could say, she owns the nest. And why not? Nobody else was using those twigs. Nobody else had claimed them. They were just lying there on the ground. But once she plucked them up and wove them together, the mother robin transformed the twigs from valueless debris into something useful and therefore valuable. This is the mistake that honest socialists, to the extent such persons exist, routinely make. Although the exact boundaries of property rights may be ill-defined and unclear, this does not automatically render the concept as bogus. Property is nothing more or less than the products of our labor. It is labor transmuted into some durable and transferable form, and yes, this applies to the land as well. To deny property is to deny that someone owns their own labor, or rather that they own themselves, and if you do not own yourself, who does? And here's a question nobody seems to ask. Why this excessive concern about property in the first place? Why do socialists assume that universal harmony will break out the moment property is abolished and we are all made equal? There's a lot more to life than just property, you know. There's a lot more to life than just property, you know. Of course, man requires shelter and food and the basic necessities, but beyond that, most of us don't require or desire all that much. Sure, who could say no to a bigger house or a flashier car or even a more reliable one? But in my observations of other human beings, the happiest moments seem to come from spending time in the company of friends and family. And you can do that just as easily poor as you can rich. You just have to avoid being an asshole. After all, there are many ways in which human beings are unequal. Wealth is but one of them. And there may be another area of life which, for most people, is far more important than all the material comforts you could possibly name. I am speaking, of course, about love. Now, don't get all sappy on me. This is still an educational program, goddammit. As we all know, some people are, for any number of reasons, unlucky in love. Some people go through one rocky relationship after another, which in comparison to others in more stable circumstances can seem dreadfully unfair. Some people enjoy happy marriages, but have strained or difficult relationships with their children, which can cause just as much emotional strife. Then there are those unfortunate souls who never find anyone at all. Perhaps they were born with significant disadvantages, or otherwise just plain unsightly and unpleasant. Perhaps there is no outward problem except a run of extremely bad luck. Whatever the case, it is inarguable that in the game of love, there are winners and there are losers. Now, is any of this fair? Would not the world be a better place if there was less inequality in romantic and sexual outcomes? Well, I, Professor James O. Flannery, propose a solution. I call it sexualism, and let me tell you all about it. Oh, you're going to love this.
supposed sexualist society, no person would enjoy love or sex any more than any other person because the state would take full control of everyone's romantic lives. Just like socialism, but for sex. How would this work in practice? Well, I have a number of schemes worked out. Scheme number one. I call this one the Prussian model. Every citizen will be assigned one primary romantic partner, one secondary romantic partner with optional homosexual upgrade, and three to four mandatory hookups per year until age 35, decreasing to two to three thereafter. For some of you, this may mean far less sex, and for others, much, much more. Scheme number two. Now this is the Nordic model. Every citizen will be issued a gratification card tracking their romantic and sexual fulfillment throughout a given year. At year's end, any citizens who have enjoyed more robust romantic or sexual lives must pay a luxury tax in the form of forced conjugality with citizens who have fewer check marks on their gratification cards. Scheme number three. This is the Japanese model. In this scheme, all consensual sex between two or more human beings is formally abolished. Instead, hyper-intelligent sexual robots will be provided by the central government, which may or may not also be replaced by hyper-intelligent sexual robots. Although this may lead to the extinction of the human race, one thing we can be sure about is that if we're all dead, then we all are, in every sense of the word, equal. No matter the details, the point is ordinary people can't be trusted to make these kinds of decisions all by themselves. They're much too short-sighted. They just can't see the bigger picture. And so that's why we need a central committee staffed with highly credentialed experts to plan, manage, and harmonize the sexual life of the nation. Sorry, Stacy, I know you've really got the hots for Chad over there, but there's a whole pack of incels desperate to get their rocks off. So when you go, have fun, you crazy kids. Uh, you too, Chad. Uh, don't argue with me, young man. You're going to have hot gay sex, mister, and you are going to like it. Now, if all this sounds absurd to you, incompatible with every known facet of human nature, that's because it is. People can't help who they're attracted to or who they meet at a given time or place. There is indeed something random and unfair about it, but God damn it, magical and beautiful also. So why should perfect equality in economic matters seem any less ludicrous than perfect equality in romantic ones? I mean, you tell me. Some people have this weird notion that humanity is like a great big family which is such a load of balderdash I don't even know where to begin. Humanity is really billions of individuals pursuing their separate interests and only rarely coming together for things like genuine national emergencies. And you know what? That's perfectly fine. For Christ's sake, we are not a goddamn beehive. Nor can we be made into one, except possibly through forced genetic engineering, and by that point you just gotta ask yourself, are you sure you're on the right side? Chapter 4, Marx, continued. In 1848, inspired by the attempted revolutions in Paris and elsewhere, Marx and Engels published their Communist Manifesto, which outlined their basic theories. According to Marx, history proceeds in a dialectical manner in which the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis are manifested through class struggle. Throughout the centuries, says Marx, these classes develop in contraposition to one another, leading to an eventual revolution in which the old class hierarchy is shattered and a new one takes its place. By hanging on to outdated imperialist dogma which perpetuates the economic and social differences in our society to cite the Communist Manifesto's own example. Feudalism was a state of affairs in which the ruling class, the nobility, oppressed and exploited an underclass, the peasantry. I thought we were an autonomous collective. You're fooling yourself. Some of whom rebelled against the nobility and after a revolutionary period emerged as the new ruling class, or what Marx termed the Borgosios. In the current stage of historical development, says Marx, the Borgosios oppresses and exploits a new underclass whom Marx calls the proletariat. In the not-too-distant future, says Marx, 
A revolutionary vanguard will overthrow the Borgosios, seize the means of production, and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat while society transitions to socialism. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. Yes, I see. By a simple majority in the case of purely internal affairs. Be quiet. But by a two-thirds majority in the case be, of more Be major. quiet. I order you to be quiet. Then, after a few more years, communism will finally emerge like a beautiful butterfly breaking out of a disgusting, repulsive pupa. Caterpillar into chrysalis. Ah, pupa. 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 Shut up! Will you shut up? Ah! Now we see the violence inherent in the system! The state will wither away from each according to their ability, to each according to their need, and on and on. Blah 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 blah. No offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. <sighs> now, some of you may be wondering what is the difference between socialism and communism. Well, communism is a theoretical state of affairs in which human beings will behave in the manner of hyperproductive zombies, automatically directing their economic activity in accordance with some kind of general will, without any need for state supervision whatsoever. Sounds like oodles of fun. Without saying, communism has never emerged anywhere at any time. Just throw that onto the huge pile of things Marx was wrong about. Was Marx ever right about anything? Uh, maybe alienation. That's it. His entire uh, is patent conjecture from start to finish. But Marx did pull off one great rhetorical trick. On the one hand, he asserts that communism is inevitable and inescapable, and on the other, he insists an elite vanguard of professional revolutionaries are required to midwife it into being. You can just imagine what kind of demonic personalities would be attracted to such a proposition. One cannot fail because the revolution is inevitable in any case. Any number of setbacks can be disregarded or ignored because every setback is merely one stage in the dialectical development of the revolution. I can't think of a single theory better suited to the mental habits of sociopaths than this one. So it should come as no surprise when a sociopathic Marxist eventually appeared to put the rubber to the road, shall we say, in a high-stakes, high-octane cannonball run straight to the gates of hell. Let me tell you about Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. Let me tell you about Lenin. <laughs>